Do you feel that in a time when we are more connected than ever, we are drifting away from real human connections, especially to ourselves? I do. Hi, I'm Leticia Latino, and I want to invite you to join me and my very inspiring guests in exploring ways to reconnect to your essence, to your definite purpose, to what makes you tick. Are you ready? Hello and welcome to a new episode of Back to Basics, Reconnecting to the Essence of You. I want to welcome Mike O'Donnell today. He's an author, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and mentor to many aspiring entrepreneurs. He's raised tens of millions of dollars in venture capital from Silicon Valley to build several tech companies from scratch. He's helped pioneer several new industries and has led several prominent startup accelerators. Mike is also a specialist in mergers and acquisition who has orchestrated multi-million dollar exits for his clients. He's an angel investor who has invested in and advised dozens of startup companies. He's a trusted coach and confidant to aspiring and seasoned entrepreneurs alike. He's also the author of several best-selling books on business planning and marketing planning, and he's a popular blogger and speaker on all things related to startup. His latest book is A True Professional, which extols the qualities needed to rise to the top of a profession. It's also the book I've given a few times to young people finishing high school or university as a great graduation gift. So having said that, Mike, welcome to Back to Basics. Well, thank you, Letitia. I am absolutely delighted to be here. I'm very excited. Since I met you, I think it's probably a couple of years ago through something related with work. I was so impressed with you, with the way you live your life that when I put the list of who would I love to come on the show, you really were one of the few people that came to mind right away. So thank you for being here. Such a high compliment. And I love following your career and your blogs and your podcast. So I'm a big fan of yours as well. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Well, you know, the purpose and my goal with this show is to really help people that sometimes feel stuck, that they don't reconnect or are not able to reconnect to really what makes them excited about life. Uh, We go through life and we see people that are almost automatic pilot, I call it. And uh, then I meet people like you and you're always so energetic, enthusiastic about what you do that I'm interested in knowing how you all got started and see if we can transmit some of that enthusiasm to anyone that's listening. So with that, I would love for you to share, you know, who was little Mike as a kid and, and your upbringing and your family, if you can share some of that with us. Oh, sure. So I grew up in Florida. My dad worked for the Keebler Cookie Company, so he was an elf, and he always brought <laughs> cookies home every night. And so we always had cookies in the house. Uh, um, but we were um, we, we were a, a fairly large family. There were five, I have, um, four brothers and sisters. And I grew up in Cocoa Beach, and it was such an interesting dynamic because on one sense, if you've ever been to Cocoa Beach, historically is a sleepy beach town. And so I loved to surf and hang out with my friends at the beach and we all had, grew our hair long. And, and so you, you would ask people, you know, the philosophy was life's a beach and the, the salt life and you see that. But the other dynamic that was going on at the time that I was growing up was it was the height of the Apollo space program. And you, you could be downtown and you'd run into Walter Cronkite or oh, yes, wow. a, any number of celebrities who were in town um, covering the, the launches. And so on one hand, I had these friends where, you know, life's a beach. And on the other hand, you've heard the saying, it's not rocket science. Well, when, where I was growing up, it was rocket science. <laughs> Literally, the parents of my friends were rocket scientists. Wow. And, and their attitude in life was life is space. It's exploration. It's pioneering the next um, part of the world. worlds. And so I had these two very odd dimensions. You know, the uh, life's a beach, enjoy it. You know, smoke a little pot, grow your hair, do a lot of surfing. And the other hand, I hung out with friends and went to their houses. Their parents were rocket scientists. Wow, but that sounds fascinating. It was a real, and they were from all over the world. 
you know, the, you know NASA was recruiting. And so that, that was a, the interesting dynamic that I grew up with seeing both sides of life, how important it is to enjoy life and enjoy the beach. But also I was around people who were always talking about the exploration of space and the universe. Very nice. And and were you at all one of those kids that said, I want to be an astronaut? Because no, I mean, regular kids have that dream. I mean, you growing up there, it's either that or I want to be a surfer or one of those things. Were your dreams pointing that direction or, or somewhere different? You know, it wasn't an astronaut. It was more to be an explorer. I think that was embedded in me to discover new things, invent new products, go see the world. So it wasn't as much, you know, I want to strap into a rocket ship and, and go explore space as much as they instilled in me the sense of, of exploration and of wonder. That's great. So you go through school there in Cocoa Beach, and then what happens? What did you settle in terms of studying and university and, and advancement, your career? Well, my, my mom will tell you that I majored in fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds familiar. Mine says I, I majored in sorority, although that, that didn't exist in my school, but I know what you mean. <laughs> yep. I, I love the fraternity experience, and I, I just happened to, to join a good one. It was some local um, friends of mine from Cocoa Beach that went off to the University of Florida, and when I got there, they recruited me into the fraternity. And so my mom would say, you know, you, you're majoring in fraternity and going to class is an extracurricular activity. <laughs> <laughs> so I enjoyed that experience so much that I was recruited out of college to go to work for the National Fraternity in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my job was really to travel all around the country to all of the different universities, to the different chapters, and, and meet different alumni from all over the country. I think I put 75,000 miles on my car in less than two wow. years. Wow. Oh, my God. And, and then before that, I had never been out of Florida. And so I'm a young kid and, uh, you know, come out of school, you go off to to my first job. And my first job is to travel and see this massive, wonderful country of ours and how the cultures are so different and people are different and even language is different. And, and so that really opened my eyes to possibility. So I guess one of the lessons I learned early is the importance of travel and meeting different people, different cultures, different parts of the country and the world. And connection, right? It's, it's funny you mentioned because it's that's what I have on LinkedIn and people have always say one that one thing about me is like that I like to stay connected and a few of the guests I've had and now you confirm it too it's it's definitely one of those qualities I think that it's innate in the human being it's we are born to connect with others Absolutely. and somehow we get lost in the day to day and people see that connection as a waste of time. I don't know if that has happened to you, but I, I, I write about this in my LinkedIn that I've had a few jobs where my boss is like, you're, you talk too much. You're like on the cafeteria talking to people. But then when someone was needed, I knew exactly who to go to because <laughs> I was talking to people and I knew what everybody was working on. It's one of those qualities that gets, gets uh, oversought, I think. Oh, absolutely. You know, there, there's an old saying, which is you, you, you can't sell me anything until I first trust you and know you. And one of the things I learned early in my career in building companies and raising money, lots of venture capital and hiring people was the core to all of that What were meaningful relationships and taking the time to get to know people and what motivated them and just listening to their stories and relating to them. That's the baseline foundation for building a great life and, and also a great company are the relationships that is built upon that foundation. I totally agree with that, Mike. And in fact, that's how we met, you know, through a potential business transaction that didn't happen, but then we connect and we keep in touch. And, and, and I always say there's a few people that I know at some point I'll do something with besides a podcast. It's uh, And you're one of them. <laughs> It's like, I, I know I find you fascinating in what you've achieved. And definitely not that many people you get to know that say, you know, I help startups. You You make... A lot of people's dreams come true if you really have it in you that you want to be an entrepreneur and you're starting your business. You help those kind of people. Can you talk a little bit more about how you got into that? I, I, obviously through connection, and, and but what guide you through that on the first place? And then 
you know, your insight into the entrepreneurship world? Well, absolutely. I, I love working with startups and new ideas and, and helping people to to bring a product to life. And that can set them for life if they if they do it well, they do something they love. And eventually, of course, they can they can cash out and, and reap the rewards of all, all of their work. So I, I after be, being an entrepreneur and starting and, and selling a few companies, people were always asking me to lunch. <laughs> or, or, or coffee, Mike. Um, I had no, you know, can, can you grab an hour? Or can I grab an hour of your time? Or do you want to go have coffee? And I was doing it so much because people, everyone has ideas, right? Everybody has an idea, and they think, could this be a business? How would I make money? How do I bring this to market? How do I develop it? How do I raise money? All of these questions. And so um, I was doing all these lunches and coffees, and, and was being crushed under the weight of all the time that it took. So I first created a website called startupbiz.com and I tried to put up there all the best practices and links and connections. And this was in the early days. I think startupbiz.com was one of the very first sites on the internet to help entrepreneurs and startups. And that just grew organically and thousands of people were coming and downloading things. And then these things called incubators and accelerators started springing up all over the world. You know, you have Techstars and Y Combinator and the Founder Institute. And then so they would, they would ask me, these accelerators would ask me, sometimes they're connected to a university and sometimes they're just um, a, a privately run. And they would come and ask me to mentor or to speak or to lead a session. And, and I, I started doing a lot of that. And uh, when I moved from Seattle back to Florida, there was a new one starting up in Fort Lauderdale called Startup Quest, and um, I ran that for a while, and then I ran Startup Now, and now I run Startup Fast over on the Gulf Coast. So once you do one or two, you know, word gets out, and that's how I ended up mentoring and coaching startups. And right now, I help launch about 20 new companies every year, which is a lot yeah. of fun. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that goes to the exploration side of you that you mentioned. Like with you, I see I see it so clear when you share what your childhood in general was like and then what you're doing. And that's that's probably why you're such a happy person. When I see you, you that you exude that. You exude enthusiasm. Now, of course, I'm sure that there were times that weren't the best. And, and this is part of what this podcast is also about is when, if you've had or can share anything that was tough where you kind of fell a little bit out of, uh, out of the road that you wanted to follow, what were the tools that you use in terms of keeping true to what you wanted and keeping true to yourself and, and, and saying, no, this is, this is my, this is what I want and I'm going to go for this rather than for that. Did you have any of those moments? Oh, absolutely. And, and and probably the one that was really one of the defining moments of my life was a quite a traumatic event. In the second startup I did, I had a brilliant programmer. And of course, we became very good friends. And we were creating a new kind of software, a new kind of multimedia software that wasn't on the market. Think of it as the the forerunner to PowerPoint. You know, it it was wow. it, it did this these wonderful things in terms of integrating video and audio and text and creating these amazing presentations long before PowerPoint even came on the market. And and we became very good friends. And as part of his, quote, salary, as part of his compensation, he moved in with my wife and, and I and our kids and lived in our in our basement. And wow. he was gay, uh, but he wasn't out. He didn't want anybody to know that. You know, a few of us knew it, of course, didn't care. But uh, you know, this was the the 80s, and uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of prejudices around there. And um, I was in San Francisco raising money for the company, and he decided to take a break, which he never did. He's one of those guys that work 14 hours a day. And he went out to celebrate the fact that we had just landed some funding. And he um, was picked. He was picked up by two guys and brought back to our house, my house, with my wife and kids. Oh, in boy. the basement and they beat him to death and killed him and oh my god and my wife found him the next day he was hogtied and, and dead in in our house oh. and that um that had so many fallouts first of all the funding was immediately withdrawn um lo uh, many of our friends uh, abandoned us because we lived in a small a, a more of a rural community and they frowned upon anybody associating with gay people. So they abandoned us. 
I couldn't keep the company going. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, everything was um, at a at a at a standstill it, in my life. It definitely sounds like a tough experience to go through. Yeah. And then you have to kind of get in touch with yourself. And what sustains you in that is you find out, first of all, who your real friends are. You find you you also discover the immense love of family um, and, and how the, they rally around you on times like that. And then you you discover who you are because you have to dig down deep and get through a personal trauma. You have to bury one of your best friends while you're trying to revive your your company and, and find a way to, to carry on and make some sense of it all. And that that process took two or three years. It was hard, depressing, but we ended up rebuilding the company and I ended up selling it to a publicly traded company a couple of years later. So we survived it and came through the other side. Wow. And anything in particular that you did or to, to keep going in terms of, you know, some people meditate, some people pray, some people, or, or you just kept going, which is what a lot of people say, I just kept going one day at a time. Uh, no, I, um, I, I'd say the power of prayer was helpful for me. I, I'm, I'm not an overly religious person, but in times like that, you're trying to, you're trying to reach for a higher power and some inspiration. And so, um, you know, having those personal talks with your God is, um, one of the things that, that help keep me, keep me focused and keep me grounded to, and, and, and knowing what was important in life was, was to continue to take care of my family and to continue growing and to make sure that his life was not wasted. I wanted to create a legacy for, for all the work that he had done and having to leave us so early in, in, in life. The, absolutely. I think that definitely gives you purpose at, at a higher calling, right? When you have someone that put a, so much work into it and, and didn't get to see it. That all of a sudden gives you an extra responsibility to m make it meaningful. It does. It is. It is a responsibility. And and we on on his anniversary um, every every year we from friends of his and and ours in the in our family we always toast him and and remember him. That's so important. Well, thanks for sharing that story. That definitely makes you reflect upon also the purpose of life. And it can all go away. It can all be so good at one moment and then so bad the next day. It's uh, fragile. It's fragile. It's very fragile. Short and for fragile. your friend. <laughs> yeah, for your friend, it was like life's over. And for you, it's like picking up the pieces and, and keep moving forward. Yes. And then also on the entrepreneurial side, something I sometimes share with people because I work for the family business. So even now in the situation that we are living in Venezuela, that we are all over the news and pretty much everybody knows now what we're dealing with is like a, certain, a particular situation when it touches every aspect of your life, 360. Like for me, this situation touches our family business, my family, my country, like every angle of who I am is Absolutely. affected by what's going on. And when you're an entrepreneur, in your case, it was the same. This event, it was tragic on your personal life, but it's so tragic on your professional life as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we could have lost everything and just we have to power through it. Exactly. And, and most of the entrepreneurs or, or people that think they want to start their own business, they always think about the good part of it, right? I always say, you know, people think I want to be my own boss, I want to start my own company, but they never think about the bad part of it, which is you really live it every day. Yeah, I, in, in my accelerator, I tell my entrepreneurs for every no, there, you know, for, for every yes, there will be 10 no's. And for every high, there will be three lows. <laughs> uh, exactly. And, and, and this goes a little bit on, on the sidetrack. But I'm curious when you, you see so many people that that act upon that instinct at some point to say, I'm going to go and do it. What do you think it's like the main fall down for those that don't make it? Have you identified like a few things that you can share if anybody out there is thinking about starting their own business? Well, there's a couple of things. So just from a practical business perspective, lots of people fall in love with an idea for which there is no market. And so they try and they fall down not because they wanted to give up or they didn't have the heart for it. 
It's just that they're, it, it can't make money. It, it, it cannot be sustained because it's either too early or it's not something that is so uh, so powerful. I you know, call it the 10x rule. It has to be 10x better than how it's being done today. Or if it's not, if it's only a little bit better or a little bit cheaper, sometimes you, you're not going to be able to build a business around that. It has to be 10x better. So find the 10x. So um, my, my experience in working with hundreds, thousands of entrepreneurs is first and foremost, what they're creating, there really is no market for it. And second, if there is a market for it, the the team and the the um, skills required to execute it has to be brought together. It, it, it can't just be you, it can't just be the entrepreneur trying to make, make things happen on his or her own. Have to bring people into your life and into your vision that can help you execute on it. And so that's the second place where they fall down is they don't surround themselves with the different talent, different pieces that they need because we're all strong and weak on things, right? So we have to make up for our weakness by surrounding ourselves with people who are good at things that we are not. And so people fail to do that. And sometimes it's out of insecurity or they're afraid someone's going to steal their idea or, or whatever. So they don't get the team that they really need to put the thing on steroids. And then the, okay. and then the third one is, is, is more personal life intervenes and, uh, their husband and their wife want them to, to get back to work <laughs> and, you know, because this thing is taking time and money and it's not making anything material right now. And so they eventually lose hope and they, they throw in the towel. So those are sort of my experience on, on why things don't typically make it. Okay. No, thanks for that. I think that's a uh, very valuable advice. And of course, we're going to share your, your web page and your info and on the show notes if anybody's interested getting you know towards you know the end of our interview but I think one of the most uh, valuable advices I always seek is uh, you're an entrepreneur it demands a lot of time you've sold companies created companies and you are the doting father to three children right that now they're older all grown and uh, happy and productive members of society, thank God. <laughs> and that's great. And I know this about you. So how did you balance, you know, your family in those times where, you know, it's like you have to be in San Francisco raising funds and you have to do all this stuff. It's uh, Do you have any advice in that, how to raise uh, fulfilled kids as well? Oh, absolutely. So first thing that, that I did that I found was successful, and I just watched other entrepreneurs who were being successful as entrepreneurs and also as fathers or, or mothers. And one is to weave your, your ch children's experiences into your work life. So for example, one tradition I had in my, in my family was when my child hit eight years old, they got to go on a business trip with dad. And we would we, we would weave that in or and when I or when I had international trips and I needed to go to uh, Mexico or London or whatever, I would bring the entire family and we would spend a couple of extra days. So to in, in all my kids interned at my company, right? They all had to work there <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, and they didn't report to me. I, I you know, they reported to one of my employees and that employee that was my employee was their boss. So they, they weren't reporting to dad. They were reporting to someone else who was directing their work and, and, and inspiring them and teaching them something. So weave, weave your work in, into your family life and, 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 and have your kids touch the business in meaningful ways. So they also feel a sense of ownership. The second, the second thing is just to, to realize that sometimes you do have to disconnect, kind of shut it down and go on retreat with your family some places. Well, like one of the stories I love about you, Letitia, is you, you take that pilgrimage to Italy and mm -hmm. to the old family and you get away from it all and you're there with your family and, and your town and the people that you love and the local bakery and, you know, and all of that yeah. stuff. And um, uh, we do that too. And we always had an escape every year where we just sort of disconnected and we, we just had family time. And you, you have to make time for that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, well, you describe um, you, these secrets and it's exactly what my dad did. Like he always took us in business trips with, with him one at a time, <laughs> exactly what you're saying. 
and we all work at the company when we were really little. Yeah. Even if it's like transcribing, you know, before the computer, you know, was really popular. They had all these books that they needed to be updated or whatever. He would sit us there and make us do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then we retreat every year. So the three things that, that you just described is something that my dad as an entrepreneur also did. And, and I like to think that we came up uh, pretty decent. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and I'm struggling. And I ask this question all the time and you know this because uh we've discussed it before is because I'm, I'm a mom of two young kids and I work and I try to do my best but you know my main concern is always the kids and the family and and sometimes it gets challenging because you, I'm ambitious too and I want to do great so finding that balance it's I always try to to get as much as advice as possible well it sounds like you're doing it exactly right well we try. That's uh, that's important. And well, you know, I, I mean, the last question, and I have to ask it. Although for me, it's very clear that uh, exploring and curiosity is really one of the things that makes you tick. Is there anything else that makes you tick? Any hobby or anything that, when you're able, or any place that, when you are there, you say, "Wow, yeah, this is what what I am all about." I love to write. So if uh, I, I feel fulfilled when I have strung some good sentences together and put them on the blog or share them on LinkedIn and hundreds of people comment or like and, and feel they've gotten something out of it. So I think if the, the, the one thing that makes me tick at my core is I love to communicate with others what I've learned and to share that. And also to share other people's stories. And just in the same way you're doing this, this podcast is an example, uh, and it's an extension of you and your your contribution to society and to your peers. And I'll bet that's one of the things that makes you tick in the same way that my writing that does the same for me, which is why I wrote the book, A True Professional, and why I blog a lot. So I, I love to write. That's what makes me tick and 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 seeing and contributing to other people's development and growth. And inspiration really ex excites me. Well, and, and, and it shows, and I really uh, recommend uh, checking out Mike's blog because I, I go there often, believe it or not, uh, to, to find uh, some uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom and inspiration. And I think you, you do fantastic work, and, and I thank you for that. And, and yes, I mean, for me, I feel lucky that I know people like you that have the ability to inspire others. And I do. I did feel at some point when I started this podcast that it is some sort of contribution that, oh my God, if, if my other friends or other people I know could, could listen to what Mike is saying right now, and now they can. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And I really thank you, Mike, for your time and for being part of this podcast. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, Letitia. Thank you so much. And until the next time. <laughs> <laughs>